How's it going, Astro Geeks? It is your boy, Aphelion. Uh, welcome back to the Ephemeris Podcast. Hopefully, y'all are having a wonderful day. Um, I've had a bit of a rough weekend. Uh, I went to another Science Olympiad Invitational and absolutely flopped on top of the fact that I was sick. So, um, that was not the best, but it was still, you know, it's still fun to compete at Science Olympiad Invitationals. Um, I watched the Super Bowl, ending was not fun, especially being an Eagles fan, but that is, uh, nowhere near, uh, what I should be talking about right now. So, um, let's get more into, uh, what we're talking about today in today's episode. Um, so recent episodes have dug into, like, stellar anomalies, and we're kind of continuing that train for this episode today. And uh, as I've mentioned before, it is the plan for season one. So, um, yeah, let's keep this thing going. Uh, this week's stellar anomaly is uh, our Corona Borealis variables. I hope I'm saying that right. But um, in case I'm not, I'm just going to refer to these things as RCBs uh, for the rest of the episode. Um, this is, yeah, this this anomaly is crazy. I spent a lot of time trying to make sure that I had all the facts down and everything made sense, and you know, the structure of uh, what I'm going to talk about today is like perfect, because um, when I was reading this, there was a lot of things that I skipped over, which would have made, you know, the whole podcast just sound completely inaccurate, but yeah, that tells you as much as you need to know about how weird and rare and unique uh, RCBs are, so yeah, this thing should be two parts, Uh, I should mention that, but you know what? Let's just make the uh, the episode a little bit long. Why not? Because you know, let's let's get all of this information down in one bite. I'm sure we can do it. Um, <clears throat> and I don't want to keep you waiting on uh, some of the cool things that RCBs have in store for us. So we're going to be covering characteristics and formations of um, RCBs, and we're going to talk about wait. What kind of stars can actually make this happen? Because we're yeah, once we go over the characteristics information, it's gonna get it's gonna turn into a puzzle. It's gonna turn into a bit of a mystery. Trying to um you know fit some of the pieces together and make sense of the whole thing. So let's start off with the variability of the star because I know I get a little bit too carried away with you know the really really crazy mathematics and crazy physics that go into this thing, but I don't you know. Uh, typically tend to go over some of the basics because I feel like that's information we need to cover to understand the whole thing. So there are two kinds of variabilities in a star, and since we know RCBs are variability, this is very significant to go over. I just want to make that very, very clear. I don't know. Um, So there's intrinsic variability and there's extrinsic variability. Um, Intrinsic and extrinsic factors is something we've talked about before. Like, um, I believe it was Vanishing Quasars. Yeah, Vanishing Quasars that we talked about. I think that was uh, one or two episodes ago. Um, Intrinsic and extrinsic um, apply similarly here. So uh, intrinsic means processes inside the star changing its brightness and extrinsic, sorry, I'm tripping over my words. Um, Extrinsic means the outside forces are affecting it. So uh, yeah, extrinsic would be kind of like, you know, there's like two, two stars. Uh, there's like like a star that looks like one is actually two and like the small star kind of gets in the way of the big star and it makes this variability in brightness or, you know something something along the lines of that but uh, let's talk a little bit more about intrinsic because our RCBs are going to fall into that category so there are two classes of intrinsic variables there's pulsating which basically means the star is radially expanding and contracting, uh, or at least in most cases when we're talking about like C feed variables or mirror variables, those are ones that like they expand and contract radially. And then the other class is eruptive and cataclysmic stars. So um, cataclysmic variables would include all nova that we kind of touched on in the last episode. We touched on recurrent. Um, I don't think we touched on dwarf, but dwarf novas also are in the mix there. We talked a little bit about uh, supernovas and um, that kind of stuff. But anyways, at the bottom of the list of eruptive cataclysmic variables, there is RCBs, R Corona Borealis variables. And it's one of the rarest eruptive variable stars. Um, We're going to get into why these things are so rare. 
Uh, the reason why they are is because their eruptiveness is not quite like the others. Like, um, when we think about eruptiveness, we obviously think about explosion and big brightness, uh, big, you know, big uh, flash of brightness um, when we look at all of the other eruptive cataclysmic stars. But when we look at our corona borealis, we are talking about a different kind of eruptiveness. Um, the outbursts of our corona borealis variables, RCBs, <clears throat> they happen um, when the star actually dims in magnitude rather than, you know, increases in magnitude. And this dimness is, it goes down to like nine magnitudes, which is crazy. That's like, if you think about the magnitude scale in astronomy, um, nine magnitude is quite insane. And this dimness that happens, uh, opposed to, you know, what uh, most other eruptive uh, cataclysmic stars do, right? It happens in the span of weeks, not months, not years, but weeks, which is really, really fast. And um, on top of that, it takes several months for it to get back to its regular brightness. So yeah, just a whole bunch of things that you wouldn't expect an eruptive cataclysmic star to do, right? So it's like literally, you know, seeing a star going into hiding, like it just like all of a sudden you just, it's completely dim, like what happened? Um, an alternate name for this is reverse nova, which makes sense because it's doing the exact opposite of exploding and getting bright. So some other facts that we know, so um, this is going to be important because again, I'm, I've mentioned that like this is going to turn into a bit of a puzzle, like what stars cause this, what's really going on. So let's establish it establish some pieces to the puzzle that we already know. They are supergiant stars. They have very little hydrogen and are very carbon rich, um, which is a really big issue in uh, stellar evolution because uh, most stars just, they have to have hydrogen to evolve, right? Uh, anyways, back to some of the other facts. Um, these stars have a spectral uh, class of F to G, which basically just means that they're yellow. Um, they have uh, quite a lot of carbon molecular bands in their um, emission spectra. So when you're looking at, you know, the the spectra of light that's coming from these stars, you'll see um, some bands that indicate certain uh, molecules. And um, some of the molecules you see in these stars, like C2 or like cyanide, you know, like. Um, and then another uh, important thing. Uh, to kind of lay down is that main theory suggests that the dimness in an RCB is either caused by photospheric dust or carbon dust. And this information comes from the fact that there have been some studies into uh, RCBs. So let's understand what stars cause such an enigma. So based on the variation of these, these things, and I'm telling you, there there's a lot of variety when it comes to RCBs. Uh, these variables are believed to be either yellow supergiants or carbon supergiants. And we're going to talk about why these have been selected as um, some of the candidates. Um, I know there's something I'm going to leave out um, when we're looking at this. is that um, there are a couple of anomalies within this group that are blue stars. But I'm genuinely, it's, it's an anomaly within an anomaly, which is like too many anomalies happening in one episode. So like, I genuinely cannot cover it without confusing the heck out of everybody who's listening right now. So we're just like, maybe I'm going to leave that for next time, if we even get to a next time, right? Okay, so we mentioned two, yellow, yellow supergiants and carbon supergiants, which are the two uh, candidates. So let's start off with yellow supergiants. So they're category, categorized as F and G stars in the spectral class, which is green flag. Boom. We've got one of those boxes checked, right? So that, that kind of fits with uh, something we already know. Um, they're like, um, kind of just to put it in perspective in terms of HR diagrams, which is something you look at a lot in astronomy. Uh, they're kind of in the top middle of that thing. Uh, they're not quite cool, but they're not all that hot. And uh, they're very bright. Um, and they're big, which is exactly what we're looking for, supergiant stars, right? Um, just a side note, another helpful uh, categorization of yellow supergiants is by using the mk yerk system. Uh, it has like a numerical order, uh, zero being the brightest, seven being like the, the smallest and most dim. And yellow supergiants are just like they're categorized in that system as 1A and 1B, 
Um, I don't know if it helps uh, anybody by mentioning that you can classify it like that using the MK York system, um, but I'm just putting that out there, you know. So anyways, what's important to know about yellow supergiants um, that's uh, really going to help us understand why this thing is a candidate? It has weak H lines when we look at its spectra, which signifies a lack of hydrogen, which again, that's checking another box. That's another another really good thing. Um, there's lots of ionized metal lines, which shows that the star is heavy. Um, it's especially rich in calcium and iron, and it has the C the C2 and the cyanide molecular bands that we're looking for. So green flag number two. Okay, in terms of the physics of the star itself, uh, this category of stars does, uh, it does fall into the instability strip of the HR diagram, which is where a lot of the variables, the intrinsic variables are. So that includes, you know, mirrors and C feeds. So it's in the place uh, of the HR diagram that we want it to be. Um, which is, you know, where all the variables are. So green flag number three, that sounds like case close, you know, like if we can say that, you know, dust happens to appear in the photosphere of the star, then everything checks out, right? Because that's all of the boxes checked um, from the photospheric dust to the FG spectral class, right? Unfortunately, we can't say that because um, the research that I mentioned that stated that the dust has to be either photospheric or carbon dust, right? It um, tells us that the passage of a dust cloud across the star is not consistent with the structure of the decline light curve or with evidence of dust grain evolution. So unfortunately, because of that minute detail, that's a reason to shut that candidate down. So um, if that's the case, then we have to move on to our next candidate, which is carbon stars or carbon supergiants, um, because carbon stars can be a little bit less massive than what we want. So uh, we're just going to say that the candidate is carbon supergiants. So here's where things get like a little bit complicated. So these things are asymptotic giant branch stars. So what that means essentially is that these things are stars that break off the main sequence to go on a like a crazy tangent like up to the top right of the diagram and then shoot its way left right but anyways what carbon stars are or they're they're kind of on the path to do that but they're they're just on their sharp tangent off of the main sequence that's the most important thing you need to know and when that happens um stars tend to become uh, less massive, but more luminous. So that's where we get, you know, the brightness and a little bit of the supergiant aspect of it, right? Um, but yeah, I'm not going to go too much into asymptotic giant brand stars because I tried really, really hard to understand, like, what was going on with the asymptotic giant, giant branch or abbreviated AGB. But it's, it's really complicated. I'm just going to give you a really simplified version of it and leave it at that. So anyways... What's more important than it being an AGB star and all the complicated stuff that comes with it is that carbon stars have more carbon than oxygen, which would just explain the name, right? So what happens at the um, in the atmosphere of the star is that carbon and oxygen combine, but then carbon happens to be in excess. So all of that excess carbon that doesn't kind of combine with the oxygen turns into like, you know, C2 and cyanide and all, you know, sooty material, essentially, is what we call it, um, which correlates to the info that we have about the dimming of the star, like the carbon dust, right? So that can explain the carbon dust. So that's that's one box checked, right? Classical carbon stars are known to be long period variables. All right, there we go. That's something, you know, uh, there's, uh, there's some more possibility there, right? So it's everything about carbon and variability that an RCB has. Right, but the issue um, that comes up with this candidate is that it's really, really difficult with that carbon dust to be able to look at the absorption lines of um, of the star, which means it's very difficult to identify, a, like, kind of give it a spectral type, right? But if we can get past that, you know, um, and be able to say, hey, these things have a spectral type like F to G, then everything checks out. But, again, but, with the same research that we said that it has to be uh, photospheric or carbon dust that's getting in the way and causing the dimness, 
Um, that study uh, tells us that this theory falters depending on whether you assume the carbon dust forms like 20 solar radii away or in the photosphere. Um, so yeah, again, this story just, if you go into the details of why this is and you know, like what was done to figure this out, it gets extremely, extremely complicated. So I've left you with a simplified version to save you a little bit of headache. But I know I mentioned there was two candidates, but I left out one that is more popular than both of these candidates with candidates, which sounds like absolutely bonkers because these things sound like they ch they like they check all the boxes uh, except a couple caveats. But it's not even the most popular opinion, and there's a third one that we've just completely left out because it's a highly speculated one that. I don't know it it gets it gets crazy once you get into this third candidate but we're we're going to we're going to get into it. So, lo and behold, the hottest theory out there of what causes an RCB is actually the result of two white dwarf mergers, which is like literally absolutely nothing that we've talked about so far. So, um for me to help you guys grasp the possibilities of and why this is a really really hot, you know, hot category or sorry candidate um let's just start off by um looking a little bit more into non-classical carbon stars because they're really the only kind of stars that are going to give in, give us an idea of like um how two white dwarf mergers would really work here because with the information that we have like it sounds like two white dwarf mer mergers should not be in the mix at all so there's such a thing as a non-classical carbon star, and these things are believed to be binary systems, right? The idea is that this supposed binary system is made of a giant star and a white dwarf. The giant star obtains its carbon-rich material from the white dwarf as it follows the main sequence. So it didn't have it, you know, it did, it wasn't like, you know, pre, it just, it, it wasn't there before it got it from another star, right? But because it has been so long since the mass transfer event happened of, you know, the uh, the main sequence star getting the carbon from the white dwarf, all we see is the carbon star, right? RCBs are believed to be hydrogen deficient forms of these star, but no correlation can be drawn between these two because um, they aren't variable and they don't have the infrared radiation that RCBs have, right? So to make up for this gap, what the conclusion that I'm drawing is that, um, uh, you know, uh, it is proposed that uh, RCBs are a result of two white dwarf mergers rather than a giant star and a um, white dwarf, right? So instead of having those two, you'd have a helium white dwarf and you'd have a carbon oxygen white dwarf. And since they both lack hydrogen, that checks two boxes, right? You've got the lack of hydrogen abs abundance of carbon and the carbon lines. As for the variability of a star, it's believed that the condensation of carbon to suit would cause the dimness. So that's three boxes checked by this thing. The last boxes left unchecked are the mass of the star and the spectral type. And what puzzles me the most about this is that for you to be able to check those boxes, like there's like there's no assumption you can make that has a basis like i mean like the largest white dwarfs get to about 1.5 solar masses right so if you had two of these things just happen to merge you'd probably get like three four solar masses which is not even big enough right and then you like white white dwarf mergers don't give us any clues about what possible spectral type they'll have to be able to create these RCBs. So it's 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 a really, 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 really confusing theory that somehow happens to be hot because um it it explains more about the formation of the RCB rather than the existence of it, but it has less checked boxes than the other two candidates have. So it's a crazy story. Like you've got two You've got two solid um, candidates that have a couple caveats that need answers. And you've got, you know, a crazy, wild, radical theory about two white dwarfs merging that just 
explains the evolution of the star itself, but doesn't give us much about, um, you know, how we can currently identify it as an RCB. So that, yeah, that doesn't make up much for the fact that a lot has to be proven about the formation of RCBs and its dimness, unfortunately. And if that fact disappoints you, I'm really, really sorry, but I just, I found this, I found this dilemma really, really interesting. You've got a star that dims rather than brightens, and you have no clue how a star like that would evolve because it lacks hydrogen, and stars don't regularly evolve without hydrogen, so you either have to pick out candidates that go through a semi-regular evolution, um, but don't have a couple of boxes checked, and then you have one that explains the whole evolution, but just doesn't, you know, doesn't explain how we would be able to identify such stars as RCBs. But um, I honestly, I think that's just a part of science. You know, there's there's just a lot still to be figured out. Like only about 150 of RCBs have actually been identified when it was proposed that there should be like, I don't know, 100,000 of them. So these things are really rare, weird, and unique, as I've mentioned throughout this episode. And yeah, um, I think this is just a story that tells us that we still have a lot of learning to do. But anyways, that is all I have for today's episode on the Ephemeris Podcast. I hope you guys have enjoyed that. Um, Maybe something to really pick at your brain. Uh, Perhaps it was something that left you a little bit disappointed by the lack of, you know, cohesiveness of the theory behind RCBs. But um, anyways, if you enjoyed the podcast, uh, then make sure to follow me on Spotify. If you're listening from YouTube, make sure to subscribe and check out uh, the Spotify channel and vice versa for Spotify listeners. Um, And yeah, that is just about it. That's all I've got. Uh, And until next time, I will see you guys later.